Columbia River Bar, where the mighty Columbia River meets the Pacific Ocean. The bar is known as the Graveyard of the Pacific for all the ships that have wrecked there. Ships still make the crossing here, plying the waters of the Columbia River up to Portland. Fish used to make this passage, five species of salmon by the millions. The Columbia River is wide here, requiring an extensive span to connect Oregon with Washington State. Looking back toward the ocean, we see the entrance to an important shipping channel. Approaching Astoria, Oregon from the river, we see the remains of the salmon canneries that once lined this river. This was once a bustling business center where seemingly endless supplies of fish were harvested and processed for human consumption. But where are all those fish now? The ghost of old canneries remind us that there's no such thing as endless. This inland stream has only the bare skeleton of the cannery that once occupied it. Elementary school students learn to graph the populations of Columbia River fish over time from the year 1900. You can definitely see a pattern in the graph. Students used data from 1900 to 1980 then applied those numbers to creating line graphs. When salmon were caught by the millions in seines that span the river, their populations immediately crashed. The native people of the Columbia River Basin considered the salmon sacred, and there was no shortage of them when they made their epic spawning migration. Even far inland from the ocean, salmon supplied a major portion of the people's diet and allowed many tribes to live well with plenty. The Native American's creed was to take what you need, but always leave the rest. Today, by treaty, Native Americans along the Columbia River retain their family's ancestral fishing platforms. This pattern of plenty lasted thousands of years, hardly even upset by white fur trappers. After exploration by Lewis and Clark, and following a treaty among European nations with claims on this area, settlers from the United States began their own epic migration to Oregon. They found the Columbia River to be a dangerous but necessary means of transporting them to their dreams of free farming land. They found a healthy, abundant forest and a river teeming with salmon. There's still abundant forests along the Columbia River and an important transportation means as well, with products from the east coming in and products from Oregon, Washington, and Idaho going out. It wasn't long before those early settlers and their children brought major changes to the Columbia River watershed. Canoes were replaced by paddle boats as Portland grew from a muddy flat called Stumpville to a world-class shipping port. The Oregon Territory became the state of Oregon as settlers and miners poured in from other parts of the country. Farmers found markets for their crops beyond the gold fields of California and Oregon. Wheat from eastern Oregon grew well in rich soil left over from a cataclysmic flood millennia earlier. Demand for lumber grew, resulting in logging, which often damaged salmon spawning grounds. All this economic activity increased river traffic and resulted in changes to the river to facilitate this river traffic. The Columbia River found itself a major transportation corridor, hosting ships from all parts of the world. Little thought was given to how all this activity affected Columbia River salmon. Rail traffic was developed on both sides of the river, once causing a landslide that completely cut off the salmon migration. Oil from North Dakota is shipped through here, threatening to pollute the river in the case of more derailments. 
passenger rail continues on the north bank with Amtrak's Empire Builder linking Portland and Seattle with Chicago. All these changes had their effects on Columbia River salmon populations. Some declines were met with regulations like stopping the giant seines and industrial size weirs and fishing wheels. Regulation of fishing practices helped at times as did fish hatcheries, but the fish population continued their disturbing decline. Of all the human activities that affected the fish populations, the greatest culprit was the building of dams on the Columbia River and its tributaries. This is a fish discharge structure from the Bonneville Dam, the first of over a score of dams on the Columbia River and its tributaries. Constructed during the Great Depression, this massive structure spans the width of the Columbia River. Built to control devastating floods of Portland and to produce electricity, Bonneville Dam was built by the U.S. government while dictators were building their armies for another world war. Another reason for building this and other dams was to make the Columbia River safe for boat traffic. River traffic can get past the dams by using the locks. Traveling upstream, the lock will lift the boat to the water level behind the dam. This structure is not designed for fish passage. This is for boats of all sizes to pass the dam. This is the approach to the Cascade Lock at Bonneville Dam, heading upstream. Looking astern, we see the lock gates closing at 400% of the real speed. Once they're closed, the water level in the lock will rise, lifting the boat. Salmon and other fish do pass through the Bonneville Dam via fish ladders. They all pass through here, where a fish counter notes every fish that comes through. These dam fish counts are considered the most accurate accounting for fish passage on the Columbia River. Much less charming than salmon, these lamprey eels also pass through here. They latch onto the sides of salmon as parasites, but they are native and they're part of the salmon cycle. The ten giant turbines in the powerhouse produce electricity that powers much of the Pacific Northwest. Mandated to reduce fish mortality, Turbines have been re-engineered to be less lethal to fish on their downstream migration. Fish ladders are designed to mimic the conditions of salmon runs. On the far side of the ladder, we can see salmon jumping up on their way upstream to their spawning grounds. They struggle against the current. They'll continue until they find the stream where they were hatched or die trying. Passage for boats is easier. The lock has reached the level of water impounded by the dam. Now the boat can continue upstream where other dams and locks await. Here we see where all that electricity is sent out on power lines. Homes as well as industries are powered from this river. Columbia River salmon have paid a price for that electricity. To help reduce salmon mortality, hatchery salmon are barged downstream. This is a salmon barge designed especially to keep them alive and healthy on the trip. They time this transport and release to keep the hatchery fish from mating with wild salmon stock. The Columbia River watershed is huge, reaching north far into Canada and east into Wyoming. Many of these streams are dammed. While the Corps of Engineers is working hard to make each dam less lethal to fish, salmon must pass through so many of them. Even here in Hell's Canyon on the Snake River, plans for a dam had to be defeated for the sake of salmon and to keep this part wild. Columbia River salmon populations are unlikely to return to pre-Columbian levels, but they are increasing. Human efforts to have a positive effect on wildlife can seem extremely challenging, but they can make a difference.